So we talked about bones, and now we're going to talk about um, the articulation of bones, the joints. So we're going to talk about um, three classifications of joints. And then within one of the classifications, um, we're going to um, talk about specific types. So um, the synarthrosis is the first type. And when you think about it, if you break down the word, um, syn is um, like a negative. So it's like very little motion of the joint. So the junction between the joints allow for little to no movement. So places where we want these synarthroses is um, where we want the bones firmly bound together and we want to transmit forces from one bone to another. So the um, big example of this is the sutures of the skull. Um, we don't want our skull bones moving around. <laughs> we want it to be pretty firm and we want to transmit forces um, throughout the area to protect the brain. That is, um, that's the uh, function of the cranium and all the bones of the cranium. So um, the amphiarthrosis, they're usually formed primarily by fibrocartilage and hyaline cartilage. Um, they allow limited amounts of motion, but their primary function is to provide shock absorption. So examples of amphiarthroses are the, um, the uh, vertebral joints that, where we have the fibrocartilaginous disc in between the vertebrae, um, the uh, pubic symphysis, those are all shock absorption um, areas. So we want to absorb shock, but allow a limited amount of motion. A diarthrosis is another name for a synovial joint. Um, and most of the joints, a lot of the joints in our body are synovial joints. Most of the um, ones that provide a lot of movement are synovial joints. So um, a synovial joint or diarthrosis is an articulation that contains a fluid filled joint cavity between two or more bones. Um, it there are seven uniquely functioning categories, and we'll talk about all of them. And all synovial joints share seven common attributes. Isn't that convenient that there's seven types and seven common attributes? It makes it easy to remember. So this is your sort of your classic um, drawing of a synovial joint. You have um, a joint capsule. You have the synovial membrane, which produces that synovial fluid. Um, there might be some bursa, which are little fluid-filled sacs that are protecting um, tendons from bony prominences. Um, you're going to have some articular cartilage um, where the bone ends come together. We have synovial fluid, and um, we also have nerves and blood vessels. So the nerves are important for our um, proprioception and our balance or joint sense. And we will talk way more about that in other classes, but just an introduction to it now. So the seven common elements of synovial joints, the first one is synovial fluid. So the picture here is from a cadaver study. And the reason I have it in here is because it is really interesting. It's the elbow. It's interesting to see the joint capsule and also see how much connective tissue there is around a joint. You know, with pictures in the book where we're just showing bones, they seem pretty, and when we're working with bony models in the lab, we don't see all the structure that the connective tissue has that surrounds the joint. So that articular capsule is, um, it's like shrink wrap around your joint, so it really holds your joint together. But the synovial fluid provides joint lubrication and nutrition to the joint surfaces. Um, a lot of times our articular cartilage, the only place where it gets nutrition is from the synovial fluid. Cartilage does not have a great blood supply, and so therefore doesn't heal very well or heal very fast. Um, and so it has to have that synovial fluid in order to get its nutrition and lubrication. The articular cartilage um, dissipates and absorbs compressive forces. That's its job. Um, the articular capsule or joint capsule is the connective tissue that surrounds and binds the joint together. That's your shrink wrap holding the joint together. And it holds the synovial fluid in as well. The synovial membrane is on the inside of the articular capsule. It produces that synovial fluid. Um, capsular ligaments are thickened regions from connective tissue that limit excessive joint motion. And when we talk about the individual joints, we will talk about the individual ligaments and um, exactly which motions they limit.
So that's how I want you to think about ligaments. I think of them as sort of the strapping tape of our body. They're preventing certain motions. So if you think about a ligament, say what motion does it prevent? Okay, um, blood vessels to the um, synovial joint provide nutrients to the joint, very important. Um, sensory nerves transmit signals regarding pain and proprioception um, to the nervous system. So very, very important for balance, very important for um, pain signals. So um, our seven different synovial joint classifications, we're going to talk about um, the, the type of joint and then examples of the joint. And I would like you to be able to name examples of all the different types of joints. Or given an example, you can say which type of joint it is. So we, there is a um, pre-lab worksheet in this module that, um, where you classify different joints. And we will, you can, I would like you to do it before you get to lab um, in April, and then we'll go through it in lab. So the first um, synovial joint classification is a hinge joint. The hinge joint has one degree of freedom. It allows motion in only one plane um, about a single axis of rotation. So they call it a hinge joint because it is similar to the hinge of a door. So the top picture is a hinge of a door. The um, humeral ulnar joint, also known as the elbow joint, is your classic hinge. One degree of freedom, one plane of motion. Um, a pivot joint also has one degree of freedom and one plane of motion, but the plane of motion for a pivot joint is the transverse or horizontal plane. Um, and so a pivot joint allows rotation about a single longitudinal axis of rotation, similar to rotating a doorknob. Um, the proximal radio ulnar joint is an example of a pivot joint. Another example is the C1, C2 atlantoaxial joint in the neck. Um, it's a pivot joint. It allows that rotation. So um, it shows the picture here. So one degree of freedom. One axis of rotation is the vertical axis, and it's in the transverse or horizontal plane. Um, an ellipsoid jo joint is a convex, elongated surface mated with a concave surface, and allows motion to occur in two planes. So it has two degrees of freedom. And so two planes of motion, that means we can do circumduction with it, right? So the radiocarpal or wrist joint is our example for our ellipsoid jo joint. So we can move in the sagittal plane, we can move in the frontal plane. Two degrees of freedom, we can circumduct. So we can clean out peanut butter jars with our wrists. I'm sure that's the reason. The bone socket joint is an articulation between a spherical convex surface and a cup-like socket. It allows wide ranges of motion in all three planes. Three degrees of freedom, so we move in the sagittal plane, frontal plane, and the transverse plane. Hip and shoulder, those are our classic ball and socket joints, glenohumeral joint and um, femoral acetabular joint. So um, the ball and socket joint has three degrees of freedom, and it can move in all the, those different directions. So obviously, these joints favor mobility. Some joints favor stability, these ones favor mobility. A plane joint is an articulation between two relatively flat bony surfaces. It allows limited motion. Um, it might slide and rotate in different directions. So sometimes you can think of it as being two degrees of freedom. So there's like translation and rotation, maybe. So two degrees of freedom, a lot of the intercarpal joints of the hand and the intertarsal joints of the foot are um, plane joints. And usually these guys, there's not a ton of motion, but when you add it all together, you get a lot of motion from those joints. So each individual one doesn't have all that much, but all of them together um, give you a lot of freedom of movement. The saddle joint, it's special. There are only two of them. Well, four of them if you count both sides. There are two of them on each side of the body, two different types. Um, so the saddle joint is concave and convex at the same time. So it has the little stylized picture of a saddle. You can see the concavity and the convexity. Um, it allows extensive motion primarily in two planes, but you can almost sort of think of it as like two plus planes. 
So um, there, there's a lot of motion. So our carpometacarpal joint, our first carpometacarpal joint in the thumb is um, one of our saddle joints, or two of them, left and right. Um, the other saddle joint is at the sternoclavicular joint. And that sternoclavicular joint is really the only bony attachment of our upper extremity to our axial skeleton. And um, so it doesn't move a lot, but it moves in a lot of different planes. So um, the saddle joints, one concave and one convex surface, and it really provides a lot of different options for motion. Condyloid jo joints, um, it's an articulation between large rounded convex member and a relatively shallow concave member. So the knee joint is a classic condyloid joint. Um, some of the um, metacarpophalangeal joints are condyloid jo joints. When we talk about the hand, we'll talk about individual ones. Um, most of the joints allow two degrees of freedom. So in the knee, we have that, um, that sagittal plane freedom where we can flex and extend, but there's also some rotation um, in the transverse plane. And that transverse plane action allows us to do things like lock our knees into extension, and um, it provides a lot of the functional movement in our knees. So um, I think of condyloid joints as being um, like one, one bone that has sort of knuckles and the other one that has a little um, indentation for those knuckles go, to go into. So the femur has the knuckles and the tibia has the indentations. So um, condyloid jo joints have two degrees of freedom, um, two planes of movement.